on the instructions of Gurudev and with his mercy we continue our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita Adalila chapter 4 by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami in the translation from Bengali by and with the commentary by Srila Bhaktivaranta Swami Prabhupada. We're reading chapter 4 uh, of the Adi Lila, the first of the three sections of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Chapter 4 is entitled, as you remember, The Confidential Reasons for the Appearance of Sri Chaitanya. The Confidential Reasons for Appearance of uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And now we understand that confidential means the internal, those reasons that are known only to him, that are coming only from him, uh, operating only in him, origi originating only in him. They're spiritual reasons. They're reasons from his soul. Why his soul? From his soul's point of view, he desired, and indeed, to carry out his mission, he needed to appear in the form he did. So they're the spiritual reasons, but then also, as we know, they're the heart reasons. They're the heart reasons, both in the sense that he's... Um, desire was to share Prema Bhakti with uh, all living jivas. I'll come back to that in a minute. But also because the heart reasons, the reasons for his appearance, the internal reasons for his appearance are about his feelings. They're about wanting to feel. About wanting to have emotional experience about wanting to have loving experience. Having been the object of the affections of, of all the jivas forever, somehow Krishna came to the realization that there was one thing he had never experienced, one thing he'd never enjoyed, one thing he'd never had pleasure of, even though he'd have the pleasure of the love of all the living entities. And that was the pleasure of loving God himself, the pleasure of Prem. And so it was truly an emotional reason that he chose to appear. That was the confidential reason, that was one that, what he wanted to feel, what he desired to feel. And this means that he thought he would be more himself, he would be more divine, he would be more God if he could feel, if he could feel what it was to love God. And that is, of course, the confidential reason for his appearance. Chapter four follows on chapter three which I hope we have the pleasure to read together another time. And chapter 3 is, of course, the external reasons for the appearance. And by external reasons, then, he, we mean the reasons related to the material world. Not entirely, but related to the material world. So these reasons touch the material world. They create a bridge from the divine soul, the divine spirit, to the material world. Or maybe we could say the marginal world because we're talking about the jivas. He understood that part of his pleasure, his ability to feel more deeply 
was to let the devotees understand, let the jivas understand, that the source of pure feeling is devotion. So his external cause, his external reason for appearing, was to share with the jivas, and that means all jivas, prema bhakti, the practice of devotional service. Now, even though we're focusing on chapter four, the internal, the confidential reasons, the spiritual reasons, we cannot separate them from the external reasons. So the, the, the path for Krishna to increase his experience of loving pleasure, of the of Prem, the pleasure of loving God, requires the assistance of the devotees. Chapter 4 requires chapter 3, to put it that way. It's by virtue of the jivas engaging in devotional service that he can have the full pleasure of loving God in the form of, of Radha. So the story begins with taking the, the, taking the position and the shape and uh, the point of view of Radha and tasting what she tastes as the lover of God. But we mustn't forget that that loving experience, that prem, is nourished by devotion of the devotees, of the jivas. It's only made possible by the loving service, which he introduces in his external reasons. Okay. So this double, double task, we could say, of chapter 3 and chapter 4, is both to understand what he wants in his soul, what he wants as the goal of his own spiritual path, namely to increase his experience of love by experiencing the love of God and the realization that it's only with the help of the devotees that this is possible. It's really quite a miraculous pair of realizations. That there's one more step for Krishna to take and he needs the help of every single jiva too to fully realize that. Because it's through the devotional service of jivas that the flow of Radha's loving energy can take place, and it's f through the flow of Radha's loving energy that the experience of loving Mohan, the experience of Prem, can increase. Still no Munger Mandir. Um, and this double relationship is is has been the 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 foundation for our reading so far. That we kind of put Mahaprabhu at a crossroads between an internal experience of his soul, his desires to love, and an external experience, which is the relationship to the devotees, to the Jesus. And in a very loose, informal way, I put that into uh, in two phases of his, his life. But I have, to, um, I have to underline that it's very loose and informal because it's, a, it's also a bit of a continuum through his life. But we divide his life often into two parts, before and after his sannyas, sticking sannyas, which he does at age 24. So his birth lila, the Navadvip lila, we say. Navadvip is his birth town in West Bengal. 
where he's primarily in external consciousness, but experiences that consciousness as a devotee. He understands his role as being a devotee of Krishna, practicing Sankirtan, preaching like a devotee, uh, acting like a pure devotee, becoming a brilliant uh, Sanskrit scholar, uh, becoming a brilliant teacher, and becoming well known, well known for all these things, but always in the mood of a devotee who's completely humble and completely, um, uh, what should I say, surrendered to, to Krishna. And this is, of course, one of the aspects <coughs> of the mature Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as well. Complete humility, complete devotion. And then we often start talking about another phase from around 24 when he takes sannyas. Some people say a little bit earlier, which you might call the Braj Lila, where he starts having internal experiences, realizations, uh, visions, dreams about Radha and Mohan and what we understand to be the Vrindavan Leelas, uh, these Leelas that we read about in Vilapakus Manjari and, and Ras, uh, Radha Rasa Sudaniti, where in his spiritual consciousness he's fully divided into two, well, I shouldn't say fully, but he's divided into two bodies that are interacting, that are seeking out um, the... the the play of love and the transfer of love. And he comes to take this identity, a more internal spiritual consciousness, in addition to the identity of being a, a humble um, devotee of Krishna. And this is where he begins teaching to the, as, as we know, the, the Goswamis and his other associates in uh, Puri. And this phase con continues until the rest of his life. So I think we can we can identify these two uh, characteristics, uh, these two let's say moods of Chaitanya all along this chapter four. The one is being humble, and the other being in this mood of embodying the loving devotion of one part of God the lover to the other part of God, the, the beloved, the, the Radha part of God and the Mohan part of God. But to realize Chaitanya in our reading, personally, us as readers and devotees, we need to first take the mood of the first Chaitanya and become humble. Drop completely the idea that God is magnificent, that God is opulent, that God is a, a great powerful master living far away, sending us instructions about what is true and not, is not true, how to live our lives and how not to live our lives. It is true that Taitanya Mahaprabhu is magnificent, but his magnificence is interior, inside him in his heart, in the way that his heart unfolds. And this takes us to the other side of him then, in our own devotional practice. Our devotion is most pure and most clear when we're first humble. And secondly, when we aim our activities at devotional practice. Devotional practice with in our minds and in our thoughts and our hearts, increasing Radha's affection for Mohan. So externally we, were, we are endlessly humble devotees. Internally we are servants, we are devotees in devotional practice toward Radha in her efforts, in her desire 
to love more. These are the two sides of our devotional practice as bhakta. And then the one very last point that I, I brought up last time, but just to remind you because it's crucial, is Chaitanya's ecstasy. And I say it's crucial because ecstasy is a, an experience that we read about every, in every verse of Vilapa Kusmanjari and Radha Rasa Sudhaniti. Ecstasy is a Greek word <laughs> that means standing outside. Ex and stasis, ecstasy. <coughs> it's when our experience is so great, so powerful, that it begins to take place outside of our bodies. And when we read the later biography of Chaitanya, we know that he had often these kinds of ecstatic experiences in his material body. And that we could view, <coughs> excuse me, that we could view with our material eyes and the people around him could view the ecstasy that he was uh, experiencing. And that is the loving energy inside him, inside his material body was too great to be held and somehow manifested itself on the outside of his body. That's our material evidence. But there's also spiritual evidence when we're reading the, the prayers that we so much enjoy to read with Gurudev, Belapa Kusmajari and Narada Rasa Sudaniti in the commentaries by Ananda Das Babaji and um, Saraswati Prabhadananda. And then we see very often this same experience of ecstasy where the emotions are surpassing the body, in this case, the spiritual body. So the emotions are too great to be held in. And I speak again about this, I underline it again, because this is the sign of the endless growth of pain. This is how we see it. This is how we read about it and experience it in our readings, and this is how the devotees, the immediate devotees of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw it. Prem, its core characteristic is that it grows endlessly. Radha's love for her Mohan never stops growing. And the more it grows, the more pleasure Mohan receives, the more pleasure he receives, the more relish he gives to his devotees, and the more pleasure, again, Radha uh, receives and more love she gives to her mom. It's endless. It's endlessly growing. Of all the things that are fixed in the universe, one thing is not fixed, and that is the growth of divine love. And this is why ecstasy is so present in our readings and in the experience of Mahaprabhu in his material life. Last time we completed verse 30, it was a long voyage because Srila Prabhupada had a quite long commentary on it. Um, verse 30 builds upon verse 29 in an important way. And in verse 29, Krishna, who's speaking through the through the, the pen of Kaviraj Goswami. Krishna was speaking about the Rasa dance, you might remember. And he was explaining <coughs> how it takes place because of Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya is the internal energy of Krishna, which governs the transcendental manifestations. So everything that happens in the spiritual world, the transcendental world, is somehow governed by Yoga Maya. And the important point that we discussed in verse 29 and 30 was how 
both the gopis in the rasa dance and Krishna <laughs> in the rasa dance forget themselves. The gopis forget that they are married, that they have families, that the milk is cooking on the stove at home, and they are led to believe by Yogamaya that they are the unique lover of, of Krishna. And that's why we have so many comments about Pariki above. I'll mention it again in a moment, but the main issue is that the gopis are somehow released from their material activities in order to have a higher level soul experience of Krishna. They are able, they are, power went out here, but I think we're okay. They are able to, they are able to uh, experience Krishna as a soul and they are able at the same time to understand that that soul experience is one of loving relation, of devotion. So there, there were in a sense two, two lessons we learned from the Rasa Lila for chapter four. One that so the gopis understand themselves as soul beings and they understand that this soul relationship is one of, one of love. And this is the foundation of what our Gurudev teaches us to call Gopi Bhav. I am a soul and that soul is in relation to God. And that relation is one of feeling. And that was the foundation for chapter, uh, sorry, for verse 30, which, so I'm going to turn up my fan a little bit. <laughs> a little bit warm. Verse 30, I'll remind you of it. It was this. Neither the gopis nor I shall notice this. By that he means notice that they are actually, the gopis are actually married and left the milk on the fire and so on and so on. Neither the gopis nor I shall notice this, says Krishna, for our minds will always be entranced by one another's beauty and qualities. They are entranced. We talked about this last time. Both the gopis and Krishna are entranced by the beauty and the attractive qualities. So both of them forget their material forms. Quite easy for Krishna, but much a bigger step for the gopis. And they become completely focused on the beauty and the energy of attraction that that causes for them. And the conclusion we draw from this, just to summarize now last times, is well, first that Krishna is a devotee of love. He forgets everything too, just like the gopis, and becomes completely present in that loving moment. He loves the gopis' love. He doesn't know what's happening but he's delighted about the gopis' love. He's taking great pleasure from this to the point where, as we know, he's going to take so much pleasure in it and enjoy it so much that he's going to ask himself, what must that feel like to feel that love for God? Which is the internal question which leads him to appear. The second issue that came out of the commentary from Srila Prabhupada last time was that Chaitanya did not appear in order to tell us this, to preach this. It's true he spends lots of his youth preaching Bhagavatam, but this point, the point that the love of gopis is so important, that loving relation is so important, this he doesn't teach, this he shows. Prabhupada in his commentary 
reminded us that the only way to communicate loving devotion is to show it. This is simple. If you want to teach your children to love, if you want to teach your friends to love, you call them up on the telephone and say, here are the instructions for loving. No, of course not. You show them your heart, you show them your feelings, you show them your gestures and, and, your, and your behaviors for love. It means releasing the love that's in your heart. This is how we communicate loving devotion by showing that we have it already operating inside of us. That is another way of saying what Gurudev teaches us, that we must be viewers, not doers. We must let the love that's naturally living in our hearts, we must let it flow towards others. Let it flow, not make it flow, not command it to flow, not write a book about how to make it flow, but to let it flow. The love inside us wants to flow. It's in its nature to flow. Our task is to clean away the blockages, the material coverings, so that our natural loving soul is open wide. This natural, loving soul is our svarup, our spiritual self, our spiritual identity, our spiritual form. And we learn in bhakti that the nature of the sarup is loving devotion. When we're being most ourselves, we are loving. When we are most ourselves, we are natural devotees. It's not something we need to learn from a textbook. We need to learn nothing except to be ourselves. The third point from last, from the from the last, we could say the last two weeks, two lessons was about parakia. And to be very brief, what is important about parakia, which means uh, belonging to another. Para means other or beyond, and kia means relating to. So we say paramatma, which means beyond the soul, the super soul, or we say paravidya, and that means higher knowledge, beyond knowledge, etc. And here, mostly, we talk about parakya as being beyond social rules, beyond the institution of marriage, outside of it. But we must understand, and Prabhupada reminds us very nicely in his commentary, that we're not talking about parakya in material consciousness where it would be simply breaking the rules of a, a marriage promise we are talking, talking about parakya in a spiritual sense breaking the molds breaking the rules breaking all limitations which uh, stop us from perfecting our love. That is what parakya means in the spiritual level. And yoga maya is in, in this sense the energy that governs parakya above. It's yoga maya that's arranging the, the experience of the gopis and Krishna in the rasa, rasa, rasa dance. So, to summarize everything now, and then we'll move forward. Rasa Lila, the Rasa Lila, the dance, the Rasa Dance Lila, 
is the summary, the highest moment of soul consciousness. It's the foundation for what is going to become Manjari consciousness or Manjari Bhav. It's understanding that the relation between the Jiva and the Divine is spiritual, it's a soul, soul relation. We have a soul and it's in relation to the Divine. And that this relation is one of feeling. And this relation in the Rasa Lila becomes very attractive to Krishna, to the point where he wants to explore it himself. And that's what he does in his appearance as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So now at last we can return to um, verse 31. Still looking for a administrator. Punyam, if it's easier for you to give me the the hosting uh, task, then I can I can make the um, interpreter. We have, we have like very big internet problem. I with like no virus. <laughs> So maybe I try to become host today because Brinda is very weak in time. That's just I fine, my dear. Thank you. But I uh, was, I think. Give me one minute. Oh, you have the logon. Very good. Okay. I don't have it. So, verse uh, 31. And I hope you're not tired with parakia because we continue it here, but in a different, um, let's say, on a different level. Uh, Krishna is still speaking through the pen of uh, uh, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami. He's still speaking or maybe he's thinking through the thoughts of Krish, uh, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami. The verse is this. Dharma chadi rage dona karaya milana khabu mile khabu namila dahi viragattana and Prabhupada translates this way. Pure attachment will unite us even at the expense of moral and religious duties. Destiny will sometimes bring us together and sometimes separate us. Pure attachment, adage, so it's chadirage uh, dunne, adage, of which you know the word niraga, so you know that it means emotion or passion. So, um, pure attachment is the translation of raga. Okay, hallelujah, Ananda Prem can get to work. So we have Japanese translation now, everybody. Thank you, Kishori Diti. Pure attachment, which means attachment by passion, not by reason or by choice or by logics. Pure attachment, rage will unite us even at the expense of moral and religious duties. So this is Dharma Chadi, even despite Dharma, despite our moral duties. Destiny, 
so events which are caused by fate, will sometimes bring us together and sometimes separate us. Kabumile, kabunamile. So mile, this word is related to the word male, you know, from getting together with all our friends. So what's it saying? It's saying, well, attachment through passion is absolute. Even if it contradicts our duties, our religious duties maybe, our moral duties maybe, but it's constant, it's sure, it's perfect. And then the second part, on the other hand, destiny can change. Sometimes it separates us, sometimes it brings us together. So on the one hand, we have rage, attachment by feeling, by passion, and that is solid. On the other hand, we have destiny, which sometimes goes this way, sometimes goes that way. So destiny refers not to, uh, which I say, rolling the dice or gambling like that. Destiny means some sort of plan caused by, made by God for us. And we can't know what it is. We have to wait and see what happens. So Krishna is speaking against this idea. He's saying, Raga, passionate attachment, will unite us no matter what, whereas destiny, you cannot count on it. Sometimes we'll come together, sometimes we'll be separated. Now Prabhupada comments. The gopis came out to meet Krishna in the dead of night when they heard the sound of his flute. Srila Rupa Goswami has accordingly composed a nice verse, which is also in Adi Lila 5. It's reproduced. But the verse comes from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So Rupa Goswami has written a nice verse that describes the beautiful boy called Govinda standing by the bank of the Yamuna with his flute to his lips in the shining moonlight. He already sounds irresistible, doesn't he? This is the verse, now just in translation. Those who want to enjoy in the materialistic way of society Friendship and love should not go to the Yamuna to see the form of Govinda. I repeat, those who want to enjoy life in the materialistic way, so society, friends, husbands and wives, etc., they should not go to the Yamuna where Krishna is there with his flute and playing and looking beautiful. The sound of Lord Krishna's flute is so sweet <laughs> that it has made the gopis forget about all their relationships with their kinsmen, with their families, and flee to Krishna in the dead of night. I have to change my camera there. Dead. So if you want to worry about your families and society and rules, you better not go see Krishna because he's going to, he's going to seduce you. He's going to make you forget everything. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happens in the Rasa dance and that's exactly what will happen now if you go to the Yamuna where he's playing his flute in the dead of night. But he says the sound, uh, Rupa Goswami says, the sound has made the gopis forget all their relationships and, and go. So when he says forget, he means they're forgetting their material consciousness. They're forgetting 
everything that's in their material lives and they're relating to Krishna in their spiritual consciousness. Again, this is the work of Yoga Maya, the internal energy of Krishna who's organizing this. In other words, in this verse of Rupa Goswami, the beauty of Krishna, the enchanting flute playing, makes the gopis discover their souls. That's the function. That's the function of the rasa dance. That's the function of every time the gopis go out to meet Krishna. It makes them discover their spiritual sides. It makes them forget their material lives and discover their souls. And then, secondly, like we said before, discover that their souls are full of feeling for God. They discover their souls, point number one, and they discover that their souls are full of love, point number two. And this is a very sweet Leela, very sweet story, but of course it's a message to us, to us Jeevas, that if we want to fully discover our souls, and even better fully discover that our souls are made of love and are naturally devotional, naturally eager to project love, then we should do our best to forget our material consciousness. Only by falling in love <coughs> do we find meaning. Only by surrendering to feeling is there meaning. And by falling in love <coughs> excuse me. By falling in love, I don't mean, I don't mean romantic love. I don't mean um, Hollywood love. I mean spiritual love, releasing the content of our souls. There is only meaning where there is love. This week sometime Gurudev said in class, in morning class, something so simple and so powerful, he said, that there's only meaning where there's feeling. There's only meaning where there's feeling. There's not meaning in pure information. Pieces of information don't have meaning. They come alive when we connect them to our feelings. So, Yes, it's 150 kilometers from Brindavan to Delhi, right? Information, very useful sometimes. But the moment we try to give that meaning, ah, oops, no, false alarm. I thought Paro was back on. It only has meaning when it's associated with feeling. So it only has meaning the 150 kilometers when we think about, well, I'm going to see my friends in Delhi. Or I'm going to see my friends when I get back to Japan after going to the airport in Delhi. Or I'm going to meet my husband. Or what time is dinner? Or will I able, be able to bring the, the mangoes for my grandmother? Or will I find a quiet hotel where I can dream a nice dream? Or only to the extent that the distance between Vrindavan and Delhi can be filled with feeling, can it have any meaning at all? And it's around this idea then that Prabhupada again returns, like I said, I hope you're not bored with it, he again returns to the theme of Parakya. And he says this, by leaving home in that way, of going from their husbands and their children and the, and the milk on the fire, by leaving home in that way, forgetting their man material consciousness, the gopis transgressed the Vedic regu reg regulations of household life. So they broke the rules. And that is exactly when they found meaning. This is Parakya. 
they found the meaning of love in their souls, they found meaning of their souls, and secondly, the love in their souls by breaking the rule of Vedic regulation. And that is the moment they found meaning, when the fact of the rule, the cold, impersonal fact of the rule became a matter of feeling. That's when they had meaning. This is what Guru Dev meant when he said the other day, there's meaning in life comes only through feelings. Now Prabhupada again, uh, this indicates that when natural feelings of love for Krishna become fully manifest, a devotee can neglect conventional social rules and regulations. So again, Prabhupada, and I guess me too, we're trying to apply this example of the gopis and the Rasa Lila and their attraction to Krishna in the forest of Vrindavan, trying to apply this to our own lives. Trying to say that this transformation of consciousness that the gopis have it's the same transformation of consciousness that we need to have. Letting go of some of the material conventions and finding meaning in our feelings. So feelings for Krishna here and for us as well in our personal lives Feelings take the form of break with social rules. Breaking social rules means taking the path of meaning through feeling. It means respecting the natural rules, if you like. There's nothing wrong with following our natural instincts, but when the rules come from beyond us and conflict with the, the mood that we carry in our soul, then they will block us from our spiritual evolution. And this again is the meaning of the para in parakia. Para means other. In material consciousness, it's very simple and banal. We say, well, it's the, the gopis are with the other man. They're being unfaithful to their husbands. But in spiritual consciousness, it has a higher meaning. In spiritual consciousness, it means the other of our material life. Here the other means the divine, the divine in us, the soul. So in spiritual consciousness, parakya means having a relationship with the divine, having a relationship with the divine in us, which is the soul. And that's what happens when the gopis find sneak out and open their hearts to, to Krishna. And this is what Kaviraj Goswami is telling us to do, is what Krishna is telling us to do, just like the gopis have done. Um, now, uh, Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada has a comment about this word destiny. Because for many of us, destiny means what necessarily will happen. So there's some explanation here. He says, in the material world, we are situated in designative positions. What does that mean? Designative, that means a position that's given to us. I designate you keeper in the football match. I give you that position. In the material world, we are situated in designative positions only. 
So things that have been given to us, positions that have been given to us. But, he says, pure devotional service begins when one is freed from all designations. In other words, when it's not an authority that gives us our task, gives us our role, gives us our position. It's not something that's external that gives us our position, like the social rules of the gopis, the marital rules of the gopis. When it's something internal that gives us our position, then our soul is opened. Then our hearts are opened. Then it's something natural to us, something inherent. What you, you remember Prabhupada calls constitutional. It's who we truly are when we're being ourselves. This designated position, the position that's given to us by some external authority, is false. It has no um, spiritual or emotional uh, meaning. Prabhupada continues now. When love for Krishna is awakened, the designative positions are overcome. When the gopis go out and the love for Krishna is awakened, then they drop the positions that are given to them by the external material society. That's the gopis. And then for us, what it means, when we realize our soul identity, when we realize our svarup, and even a little bit, slowly, slowly, we realize our svarup, and what is not our svarup, then we come to understand what is given to us and what is us, what this constitutional position is and what the designated position that society is giving us is. We stop thinking, we start feeling. We stop obeying the external master and we begin obeying the eternal master. And then you ask, well, we have to live in material society. The boss says, go to work at nine in the morning. You better go to work at nine in the morning. But here the answer is, if we can find material activities and material consciousness, which mirrors our spiritual activities and spiritual consciousness, then we can live harmoniously in this, in this life as sadhikas. This is much easier to say than to do, of course, but it's certainly possible. Um, Krishna, uh, sorry, uh, Srila Prabhupada, not Krishna. Srila Prabhupada continues now. The spontaneous attraction of Sri Krishna for his dearest parts and parcels generates an enthusiasm that obliges Sri Krishna and the gopis to meet together. So here we take one little step forward in our explanation of the verse. We know that by leaving behind their homes and husbands, the gopis enter into their souls and find an attraction to Krishna. But here as well, Prabhupada says that Krishna becomes, be, begins to have an attraction for the gopis. And they are both pushed by their inner selves to meet each other. It's a very important sentence from Prabhupada and very complicated. 
So he says that. On the first, he says, well, the gopis are attracted because they go into their souls. But then he says also Krishna is attracted. Why is this? Well, in the earlier part of the sentence, he says, the attraction of Krishna for his part and parcels. Well, what does part and parcel mean? In our learning about Atma and Paramatma, we understand that every Atma, every individual soul, is part and parcel of the Paramatma, the Super Soul. Every individual soul, you and me and all the gopis and all living beings, have a little bit of the divine in their souls, in their atma. Who they are is in part what who God is. So when the attraction of the gopis for Krishna increases, naturally, the attraction of Krishna for the gopis is increasing. And we know from our reading of Vilapakus Vanjari and Narada Rasa Sutta Niti how this story ends. The attraction of Krishna becomes so great that he decides to take the form of one of the gopis, the greatest, the most divine, the most beautiful, the most loving, Radha, to take her form in order to experience this love, to experience this loving himself. Now Prabhupada turns to a different subject, the subject of separation. What we call viraha, love in separation, or separation combined with longing, both being apart and wanting to be together in the same feeling. Not two different feelings, but the same feeling. And in bhakti, as you know, this describes the deep feelings of both love and pain that happen at the same time. Love and wanting, love and sadness caused by separation. It's absolutely essential to bhakti. If we did not have separation, there would be no love. If we were one being with our lover, no separation at all, which is difficult to imagine. If there were just one perfect unity, there would be no love, or there would be no loving. The key to bhakti is that loving, the love flowing between Radha and Mohan, is the highest. And if they're completely unified, then that loving cannot happen. So the loving which is the center of bhakti is always loving in separation, viraha. Separation between the lover and the beloved. Longing for unity, and uh, relishing this experience of longing. We never, ever, in any of the descriptions of of the Vrindavan Lila, not even in Govinda Lila Amrita, do we have descriptions of them being together. All the descriptions are of longing just until the moment of being right next to each other, even their hair tangled together sometimes, but never a description of the loving sexual union. It's always longing for and then right after sadness at separation. This is because bhakti is a practice of loving a love between two 
separate beings who are connected through that loving. It's longing itself, which is at the energy at the center of bhakti. And unity is the end or the stopping of that longing, if only for a short moment. Prabhupada warns us then in, in the next comment, he warns us not to confuse this spiritual longing with material longing. He says, in the condition of material tribulation, no one wants pangs of separation. Of course, no one wants to hurt. No one wants to miss the other. No one wants to be sad. Tri tribulation, by the way, means uh, difficulty or suffering. So in material consciousness, we don't want that. We don't like that. We don't like pain. But, he says, in the transcendental form, the very same separation, being absolute in its nature, strengthens the ties of love and enhances or increases the desire of the lover and beloved to meet. Remember when we talked about ecstasy before, Ecstasy is the name for a love that never stops growing. Well, here is the key to that. Viraha means that experience of love through longing. And this separation, Prabhupada says, is absolute. That means that, he doesn't mean that it's infinite, he means that it's divine. The separation itself is divine. The separation itself is divinity. The loving through the separation is, in a way, the divine itself. Yes, Radha is great. Yes, Mohan is great. But the love that Radha has for Mohan is greater than both. In that sense, this separation is absolute. And it's this that we meditate on when we meditate on the Vraj Leelas, the Vrindavan Leelas. How can we nourish that separation? How can we maintain that longing? How can we bring them together and then bring them together again and then bring them together again? That's the service mood of the Manjari Bhav. So Prabhupada says, don't think of that in terms of material suffering. Think of it as being something spiritual. That separation is spiritual, is spiritual, spirituality itself. And now he goes on and says, the period of separation evaluated transcend transcendentally, so if we look at it from a transcendental point of view, the period of separation is more relishable than the actual meeting, which lacks the feelings of increasing anticipation because the lover and beloved are both present. Sorry, I... I I either thought the thought of Prabhupada before him or I was stealing it from him, but this is what I was saying a moment ago. When the lovers are together, the, 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 the longing can no longer increase. And since increasing the longing is the key to bhakti, then this is not what is the highest point for us. There's no feeling of increasing anticipation because they're both present together. It's only when they're apart, longing for each other, missing each other, on the path to meet each other, that relishing of the nectar can take place. It's only when they're in separation, in viraha, that prem can increase. 
this, I hope this is surprising for you. It should be. Because in our material love, in our material relations, all we want to do is have, is have the big hug and be together. And close as together as possible. And then everything's fine. And, and then everything is fixed. Then we have everything. But of course, this is a material consciousness. We have everything that we can imagine right here and now. But what is beyond that? What is beyond this hug? What is beyond us living together in the house and being together in the, in the, in the, in the dinner, at the dinner table and being together in our relationship? It's everything, yes, but only everything that we can imagine with our finite material minds. What is beyond that? is not imaginable and more important what is beyond that we cannot reach because we already decided that we have everything this is why spiritual separation is divine loving love in action is not unity because where there's perfect unity there is no love there's no loving Love, loving, is a relation between two, between a lover and a beloved. It's active, it's living, it's flowing, it's loving. Again, loving is higher than love. Radha may be higher than Mohan, this is true. But Radha's loving is higher than both of them. Together their love is the highest. And that's what we're interested in. Already Mohan decided he wasn't enough. He was already God and he said, I'm bored. No, what's, there's more. And discovered by taking Radha's form what more there was. And that more was the loving relation they could have. That's what's the highest. That's what's more. That is why in our sadhaka lives, loving, devotion, relationships of feeling are our goal. In the every little moment, in every simple little moment from filling a glass of water for your guru to, to driving the car, to going to work, to treating your friends and partners with care. It's the passage of feeling. It's the movement of feeling, the energy, the flow of energy of feeling. It's the connection between Radha and Mohan that is I, not Radha or Mohan. Love requires two, doesn't it? So, to conclude with Prabhupada's comment, material love is finite. It's limited. And anyone who's been in a relationship and said, ah, now we live together, we're finished. Good, the relationship's all done. Now we can do the next thing. They quickly learn that unless the relationship is always growing, always discovering a new part of the soul, of the self and the soul of the other, then it will never last. If anyone thinks that being together is the end of the story, then there is bad news coming. There is always a new chapter in the heart of both, and this always has to be the object of a relationship, a moving, flowing relationship. Verse 32 which now, in the last verse, Srila Prabhupada gave a generous commentary and this verse has no commentary. So it'll go more quickly. Krishna is still speaking or still meditating through the pen of Kaviraj Goswami. And now he turns to the subject of the appearance of Chaitanya. Oh dear, power back on. It's, 
AC back on. Camera back on. So Krishna is still meditating. He says now, um, Ei sabarasa niryasa kariba svada, Ei dvara kariba saba bhaktara prasada. And Prabhupada translates as follows I shall taste the essence. <laughs> Too good to be true. <coughs> Good to be true. I shall taste the essence of all these rasas, and in this way I shall favor all the devotees. This verse is so rich with meaning, and I'm a little surprised that Prabhupada does not speak for pages about it, but we can speak for a moment about it ourselves. I shall taste. Asvada is the word relish, actually. I shall relish the essence of all these rasas. The rasa niryasa. You can say the essence of the essence of the, of the flavor. The concentrate, the condensed flavor of the flavor. And in this way, I shall favor all the devotees, uh, prasada, so give, give mercy, give blessing to all the devotees. So by enjoying, Krishna says, when I enjoy the flavors of love, all the devotees benefit. Through the enjoyment of all the flavors of love, the devotees have happiness and pleasure mercy, grace. What does Krishna want to relish? Well, on the level of the Rasa Lila, he wants to relish the love of the gopis. But on the level of the Vrindavan Lila, he wants to take the position of Radha and relish her love on a much higher, much deeper level. But in both cases, what he relishes, the devotees of the world benefit from. This is the gift, this is one of the gifts of our dear Lord Chaitanya. The more God tastes pleasure, the more grace the devotees receive. In order to put it a different way, spiritual Bliss, Ananda, spiritual bliss is the way, is, is, the, uh, is the path for giving mercy to others. And on its highest level, this is at the, le- this is at the level of, of Radha Mohan. The highest bliss received on the divine level, the bliss, the Ladani, the bliss of Radha, the Ladani Shakti, benefits all devotees. When Radha is loving, giving bliss, letting Radha Nishakti flow, when Radha is loving Mohan, all devotees feel mercy. That's the message of this verse. But let's bring it to even a much, much lower level. When a When someone in spiritual consciousness, even partial spiritual consciousness, feels happiness, relishes, then also the people around that soul receive mercy. Verse 33. 
Vrajra Nimara Raga Shuni Bhakta Gana Raga Marge Bhaja Yena Chadi Dharma Karana Srila Prabhupada translates Then by hearing about the pure love of the residents of Braj, devotees will worship me on the path of spontaneous love, abandoning all rituals of re religiosity and fruitive activity. To be clear, this is still Krishna speaking or, or thinking through Kaviraj Goswami. By hearing, Shuni, by hearing about the pure love, the Nirmala Raga, the same word we had in the last verse, the pure condensed Raga, the pure passion, passionate love. By hearing about the pure love of the residents of Braj, the devotees, will worship me, Bhaja, on the path of spontaneous love, Raga Marg, abandoning all rituals of religiosity and fruitive activities. So this is speaking about us. When we hear, we sadhikas, hear about the pure love of the residents of Raj by reading Radha Rasa Sudhaniti and Dilapa Kusmanjari. Then we worship Radha Mohan on the path of spontaneous love, Raga Mark, on the path of bhakti, spontaneous love, abandoning all vaidi, all forms of religiosity and all karma yoga, fruitive activities. Sorry, the word in the verse was dharma, dharma karma. So, uh, giving up dharma and giving up karma. Giving up religious customs, dharma, and giving up fruitive activity, karma. Now Prabhupada comments, many realized souls, such as Raghunath Goswami, and King Kulashekra have recommended with great emphasis that one develop this spontaneous love of Godhead even at the risk of transgressing all the traditional codes of morality and religiosity. So many realized souls, we know Raghunath Goswami. Kulashekra was a uh, poet from southern India who also wrote earlier, much earlier than uh, Raghunath, much earlier than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He wrote poetry about devotion in a different way, but he also wrote about giving up rules of morality, just like Raghunath does. Prabhupada goes on and says, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, one of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, has written in his prayers called the Manashiksha that one should simply worship Radha and Krishna with all attention. Of course, you remember that Manashiksha is a small book by Raghunath Das Goswami, which is recommended by Gurudev. And then Prabhupada cites one line from Mama Shiksha. It's this one. Nadharmam, nadharmam, shruti gana nirukatam kilakur. Translated, one should not be much interested in performing Vedic rituals or simply following rules and regulations. So it's very sweet, uh, typical, compact Sanskrit, na dharmam na dharmam. So uh, 
you should per perform neither righteous nor unrighteous things. Na dharman, na dharman, as explained by the scriptures. So he's saying it's important to it's important to underline that he's not saying that dharma is bad. He's not he's not against dharma, religious customs or morality. He's saying simply that spiritual consciousness is not interested in it. He's not for dharma or against dharma. He's saying it's not the question. It's the wrong question. So he's not for the Shruti, the scriptures. He's not against the Shruti. He's just not interested in them. He's interested in something higher, something deeper. Rules and regulations, laws by fear, he simply doesn't have interest in these. Because in spiritual consciousness, they're um, invisible. In spiritual, they are material, and in spiritual consciousness, we don't see what is material. We only see what's immaterial. Dharma is, in a way, it's complicated, but let me simplify it by saying Dharma is social religion. It's religious practices which are made into social institutions. And if we put that in, a, in the center of our practice, according to Raghunath Das Goswami in Mana Shiksha, if we put that in the center of our practice, well, it will weaken our practice. Because in spiritual consciousness, we have a higher meaning. We're looking for a higher meaning. And even if we obey social norms, for example, we drive on the right side of the road, or in, I guess in Japan, actually, we drive on the left side of the road. We do that because that's how we, <laughs> that's how we come most quickly to the temple. Not because we believe that these are deep and meaningful rules. They can make easier our spiritual practice. If we ride, if we drive on the right side of the road in Tokyo, then we'll have a car crash and we'll never become, we'll never manage to get to the temple to do our bhajan. And Prabhupada continues now and then we'll, we'll finish with this, this point. Oh, power again. He says, King Kulashekara, the one I mentioned before, has written similarly in his book, Mukunda Mala Stutra. And it's a set of devotional verses, verses to Mukunda, to Krishna. Um, I'll just read the English translation. He writes, I have no attraction for performing religious rituals or holding any earthly kingdom. No attraction. So it's not about right or wrong, yes or no. It's, I have no flavor for this. I have no taste, no feeling for this. I do not care for sense enjoyments. Let them appear and disappear in accordance with my previous deeds, my karma. They will come and go like they must. I'm not interested. My only desire, he says, is to be fixed in devotional service to the Lord, lotus feet of the Lord, even though I may continue to take birth here, life after life. It's very nice, it's quite surprising because this uh, Mukundo Malastutra is from uh, 300 years, uh, no, 400 years, 500 years before Mahaprabhu. But the point is that, again, he's not against dharma. He's not against rituals. It's just that they give no flavor. They give no taste. They give no feeling. And as I was saying before, Gur Gurudev taught us, without feeling, there is no meaning. 
nothing of meaning comes without feeling. And if you have no feeling for these laws, for these rules, then they will give you no meaning. If you have no taste, no attraction, then there will be no meaning for you. Taste is everything. This is Gurudev's teaching. Feeling is everything. And another way of saying this, I'm sure Gurudev has said it before, another way of saying this is simply that there's only meaning when there's love. There's only meaning when there's desire. Just think of your everyday life. It's easy to follow a rule that fills your heart with attraction, that your heart is attracted to. Why is that? Because it's not a rule. A rule that your heart wants has been fooled by your heart. It's no longer a rule. It's already soul. It's already internal. It's already driven by Anurag Anurag Shakti. A rule demands uh, behavior because of external force or fear or authority. But meaning comes into our lives when we tune in to our Swarup and we understand what our heart wants when we understand where our feeling is when we understand where our Anuraga Shakti is meaning comes into our lives when we realize what our heart desires and that happens when we discover our Swarup our spiritual self our spiritual form when we let ourselves be ourselves, when we let the energy that is inside us, which is Radha energy, Ladani Shakti, when we let that energy flow to where it wants to flow. And instead of biting our teeth together to do what we must do, we let our heart do what it desires to do. And then we become what Gurudev calls the viewer, not the doer. We don't fight for our, to fulfill the rules. We watch lovingly as our heart unfolds and find the way to its own nature, which is devotional service to Shri Radha Dhamma.